So uh, in the previous video, what we looked at was the impact of a regional trading arrangement. So basically we went over this problem here. Um, we have parts A, B, and C. A and B are part of the um, trade creation effect. And again, you see an impact on production and consumption. And then part C or area C is the welfare decreasing trade diversion effect. Basically because of this, we see a decrease in overall productivity because we're not trading with a low cost producer in the world. So we have three countries, United States, Germany, and Luxembourg. United States was originally the low cost producing um, country, but because Luxembourg and Germany made a regional trade arrangement, it makes it easier for them um, to trade amongst themselves and impose this tax on this third party. This third party is not a part of their arrangement, so the United States is being charged. Okay, so, so the static effects, so it's just talking more about um, the previous graph and our previous problem. A and B, uh, trade creation effect, domestic production of one member in union is replaced by another member's low cost imports, and this has a production and consumption effects. So production is gonna be A, um, consumption is part B. Now, welfare decreasing trade diversion, so area C, the imports from low cost suppliers outside the union is replaced by high cost supplier within the union. The high cost supplier in this case would be Germany compared to the United States. Now, dynamic effects, we, kind of, we didn't really talk about this as much. So it's the creation of broader markets and overall things change throughout time. So economies of scale, so over a long-term period, um, as you produce more and more, your costs change. And also um, your competition changes as well. Sometimes you'll make other agreements to help increase productivity. Um, there's also increased investment through this, um, this form of trade agreement. Um, more countries can invest into you. Uh, you'll have more technology available to you, more capital, more labor, whatever it may be, it's gonna help you in the long run. So it, overall the goal is to increase productivity, increase trade, increase consumption, production, and so forth. So is the European Union really a common market? So for decades, members of the EU have tried to build a common market with uniform policies on product regulations, trade, and movement of factors production, but persistent uh, regulatory differences between markets have adversely affected business expansion plans throughout Europe. So again, you have 18 or 28 countries in one geographic location. Everyone has different um, ideologies, different rules, regulations, and different policies affect different countries. It's not the same. Each market is not the same across the board. So that's where um, a lot of these policies run into a wall, so to speak. Um, it's not always gonna be a common market. It's really hard to achieve a common market when you have so many countries um, consisting of one uh, market. So Brexit, this is something that's been talked about for a while and very recently in the news as well. So Britain announces withdrawal from the EU. They call this a Brexit. Um, since the founding of EU in 1957, 20 country, 28 countries have joined and none have left. So the vote of 52% to 48% to exit the EU, and this was the beginning of the process. So in 2016, the movement split the, the most prominent conservative party in the UK, and their main fears was there was too much power to Brussels and also fears about immigration. So they really wanted to keep their national sovereignty now, the pros and cons of regarding Brexit. So are they better off financially? The UK contributes more to the EU than it gets in return. So their belief is we're donating so much. We're doing providing all this aid, benefit, whatever it may be, whether economically, politically, um, mi through military action, whatever it may be, they get less of a return. So in their perspective, if they leave the EU, they're going to save much more and it's going to be better off for their own country. Now, they're a weaker economy and security for Europe in general. Uh, the United Kingdom could lose foreign investment. So just think of you leaving um, this trade agreement. There's going to be some form of repercussions, whether it be countries not wanting to trade with you, some form of retaliation, whether it be trade barriers. And as we know, the more trade barriers and trade restrictions you have, there's going to be a decrease in overall production. So just make sure uh, to understand the concept of if you're leaving this trade agreement, there are some negative consequences. It's not just, okay, I can leave and everything's fine. Okay, so the formation of the EMU in 1999 led to a single currency, so there was lower cost of goods and services. You have this standardized um, form of exchange. 
um, facilitates comparison of prices within the EU, EU so you know what prices are uh, relatively to other countries that are using the same currency and it promotes more uniform prices. So you're not going to see a huge influx or a huge price of, let's just say, gasoline in one country compared to a huge um, uh, change in price in its neighboring country that's a part of the EU. Now, we also have a European Central Bank and it's located in Frankfurt, Germany. It's very similar to our Federal Reserve, but it's in charge of these 28 countries. Now, they, com they control the complete supply of euros. They set short-term euro interest rates. So again, very similar to our Federal Reserve. We'll talk more about this when we talk about currencies and the monetary system. And it maintains a permanently fixed exchange rate for member countries. So it's in their best interest to be part of this because it's more um, benefits in terms of exchange rates, borrowing, um, implementing these policies, and so forth. Now, um, negotiating a withdrawal from the EU, there's a two-year window. So how will the UK trade with the EU as a single actor? That's one of the big things. Um, are countries going to be as susceptible to trade? Are they going to be open to trade? Are they going to retaliate? That's another big thing that's going to be looking at um, in the coming years. Um, how can EU stabilize the euro? So again, it does fluctuate. There are other um, stuff we'll talk about when we talk about currencies um, later on in the semester. And then will the EU punish UK in terms of trade and security? So basically what we were talking about, will there be as much protection? Um, will both sides come to an agreement? Will there still be trade? Um, what's going to happen to the new future? That's going to be really interesting to know or and to observe. So the optimum currency era, this is a region in which it, it is economically preferable to have a single official currency rather than multiple currencies. So the benefits of having one type of currency in this large area, so Europe, for example, there's more uniform prices, lower transaction costs. The lower transaction cost is basically not having to transfer your money or to convert it into a different type of um, currency. And it's more certainty for investors. And there's also enhanced competition. Do you are open to... Uh, much more markets because you're adding them all into this one um, this one type of union. Um, and there's also greater price stability. There's less fluctuation, um, and this is better for consumers. So if you know what the price is going to be when you go to the store, as opposed to not knowing how it's going to fluctuate from day to day because of country X is affecting country Z and so forth. It's just one overarching system. Now the cost of this is a loss of independent monetary policy. So let's just say Germany wants to implement a different monetary policy compared to Spain. That's not the case. Um, it's not possible. Um, the European Union, the, the central bank for the European Union, implements a policy that's overarching and it cover, it's a blanket policy that covers all the countries in the EU that they have to abide by this um, policy. Now, not every country agrees with, let's just say, increasing the money supply or decreasing the money supply. There might be other policies. And it also eliminates the flexibility of changing um, exchange rates. And we'll talk about that later on in the semester. We're not going to get too much into it today. Um, for the monetary union to have the best chance of success, similar business cycles and economic structures. Again, if you have uniformity in throughout this process, it makes the transaction process much easier. Um, you know what to expect. If one country feels an impact of a boom, another country will as well. If one country is going through a recession, other countries will feel the impact of this as well. Um, there's no legal, cultural, or linguistic barriers to labor mobility. So again, you can go, you can be working in Spain, but also um, leave and work in France, and you still be fine. There's wage flexibility, and there's transfers are much more um, easily done throughout um, having an optimum currency area. Okay, so we kind of talked about this already. Okay, so the advantages of this currency area. Um, improves economic efficiency. Everything is done with one single type of currency compared to multiple. Lower transaction costs. Eliminates exchange rate risk. Increased competition. Again, we know competition is good. Um, broadening and deepening of euro financial markets. The disadvantage of this would be the EU countries cannot use monetary policies and exchange rates to adjust uh, these economic disturbances or these fluctuations. So each country can have their own ASAD model um, if we want to talk about that. Um, and each country might have their own take on how to fix it. So some might say they want to increase money supply, decrease money supply, increase government spending, decrease government spending. 
So the problems and challenges that they face. So problems are some countries do not meet the economic entry criteria. So some countries aren't as, um, their finances aren't as, um, what's the word? Basically, they're not using their funding um, in the most uh, most beneficial way. So that was another uh, big thing. So we'll talk about Greece um, in 2008 and then the integration of different economies without adjustment. So some economies were not as developed as, let's say, Germany, France, or Spain. Um, other countries were far behind. So again, it was difficult to reduce the deficits for these other countries that did a lot of borrowing because they didn't have the funds, they didn't have um, the capital or the labor to meet any of the requirements that they had. Now the challenges for the central bank is to focus on price stability over a long-term period. Again, you're looking at a lot of different countries, you're combining them all into one overarching entity. And it's difficult to reduce budget deficits and debts because a lot of these countries do need or did need a bailout and do need these funds. Um, and we'll talk about Greece again. So Greece and the Eurozone. So in 2008, um, Greece was really hit hard with the recession. They were in, um, they had a large debt to pay. So investors feared Greece could not pay its international obligations. So the, the Eurozone and IMF gave Greece 101 billion euros in loans. Um, as well as a bailout was, or Germany bailed out Greece later on in 2015. Now this did not eliminate all the economic problems. Again, a lot of their um, economy is based on tourism, producing labor intensive products. It's not to the developed stage as uh, let's say Germany or France or Spain or um, the United Kingdom. So again, this was one of the big issues. Um, once you adopt these countries into the, your union, other countries feel the impact of this. So if they're in a debt, you are lending some of your euros, um, other countries lending their own euros, there's different bailout methods, but still, these debts still have to be paid. And if you don't have the capital, if you don't have the um, resources to do that, again, you're just setting yourself back overall as a group. So we're not gonna talk about that. Okay, so NAFTA, known as the North American Free Trade Agreement. So in 1994, Mexico, Canada, and the United States um, joined together to make this trade agreement, basically making trade much more accessible for these three countries, having access to different markets, different resources, different capital. So it provided each member nation um, better access through markets, technology, labor, and expertise. And the whole goal was economies of scale. As we produce more and more, we want our cost to decrease. We don't want our cost to increase as we produce more and more. Now, because of this, we should have um, exhibited increase in production, um, increase in productivity, increase in efficiency, and a decrease in cost. That was the main goal. So we'll talk about the winners and losers for the United States and a couple other uh, countries. So winners and losers um, in terms of the United States, uh, the winners were the high skill workers, high tech businesses, and their workers benefit from free trade. Um, labor intensive businesses that relocate to Mexico benefit by reducing production costs. Again, it's cheaper to produce. Um, in a uh, country that has a lower GDP, lower cost of labor, lower cost for materials, um, domestic businesses that use imports as components. So if you are importing an in intermediate product, again, you need this to produce your final product. It's beneficial because your costs have decreased. You can maximize your profit through this. And also the consumer is a winner because um, we get less expensive products because of free trade. And we see an increase in competition, lower prices, better quality, all of these are good. Now, losers in this case are labor intensive, low wage, import competing businesses lose from reduced tariffs on competing imports. So let's just say you're in the United States, you have a, a product that you're producing in our domestic economy, so inside the United States. Now, when we open up to trade, when we have NAFTA, um, Mexico can produce this product much more efficiently. So we're gonna shift our production there. Now, those workers that were low wage or in this competing industry, They've lost their job, they lost their work, um, lower wages, whatever it may be, it, this hurts them. Um, also, workers in import competing, uh, competing businesses lose if their businesses close or relocate. So again, if you shift to an area where it's cheaper um, to produce, you're gonna lose jobs, there's gonna be a, a um, influx in unemployment um, due to this uh, change in economic structure. 
So the benefits and costs for Mexico and Canada, NAFTA's benefits to Mexico were much greater than for the U.S. and Canada because you're th um, a developing country and you have access to these first world countries or these developed countries' markets. You have better access to uh, technology, labor, other uh, resources that can help you produce much more. So there's an increase in production of goods and services, which Mexico has a comparative advantage in, and it makes trade cheaper. If trade is cheaper to just trade with countries, for example, like United States and Canada, which are in the same continent as yours, um, it makes it your transaction costs, your transportation costs, overall trade has become much cheaper. So the cost to Mexico, producers of rice, beef, pork, and poultry uh, say de devastated by NAFTA as they cannot compete with U.S. products. The reason why we can't compete or Mexico can't compete with the United States is, again, agricultural subsidies through the U.S. government. So again, it's not as fair to them because that's something they're really good at making, but now they can't because we have subsidies and that's in their eyes creating a unfair advantage. So for Canada, a uh, major concern that, uh, that closer integration with the U.S. economy would threaten Canada's social, uh, social welfare model. So again, their economic structure um, as well as political structure is a little different than ours. Um, they value different things compared to the United States. So Canada benefits from NAFTA mostly in the form of safeguards, so main, uh, maintenance of uh, status in international trade, no loss of current free trade preference in the United States market, and they have equal access to Mexico's market. So they can have access to um, cheaper production, uh, lower prices, and so forth. So again, they win in this case as well. Um, proponents say NAFTA has benefited the U.S. by expanding trade opportunities. We can trade with more countries, cheaper costs. Um, it's good for our consumers, our producers. It increases competition, reduces prices, stuff we've talked about throughout the semester. Um, providing a reliable size of, uh, source of petroleum, so from Mexico as well as Canada, which is good. And then um, another one of the goals was to decrease illegal immigration. So the whole idea behind this was if we provide them with um, equal access to trade, they're gonna increase their production. If they wanna increase their production, they want, they're want they gonna hire more of their workers and there'll be less people immigrating over. Again, this was one of, the, one of the cases that were made. Again, immigration is not bad, it's good. Again, we need immigration, especially here in the United States. And then the whole goal was to enhance political stability in Mexico as a country, and so it becomes wealthier. So if, it, if you look at the catch-up effect, as we introduce more capital, labor, all these different policies, and they have more people that are working, they're going to catch up to the United States, which is up higher, up higher. And again, our continent or this trade arrangement is beneficial for everyone as a whole. So the cost to U.S., so the losers, um, citrus and sugar industries that rely on trade barriers to limit import of low priced Mexican goods. So in this case, we weren't as beneficial because um, products from Mexico were much cheaper compared to ours. Now the trade barriers have been uh, lowered. Now unskilled workers in apparel industry who now face competition with low wage workers abroad leading to job losses. So again, it's cheaper to produce in different countries compared to the United States in terms of labor. Um, also, a uh, prediction of mass relocation of U.S. firms to Mexico proved unfounded. So U.S. workers um, more productive, so could be paid higher wage at no loss to the company. Okay, so modernizing NAFTA. Critics say NAFTA is unfair and a job destroyer. So you would be saying they're a job destroyer if you've lost your job or if... Um, if they're outsourcing some of your job because it's cheaper in a different country. Um, proponents maintain that trade um, agreement uh, fosters increased trade and investment, which has been always been the case. Trade always helps. Um, President Trump in 2017, the negotiations with Canada and Mexico, arguing that the original NAFTA deal in the early 90s is ill-suited for 2017. Um, issues under this discussion were digital trade, energy, and then the dispute settlement. So again, there's a lot of different things that um, President Trump argued, um, eventually pulling out of NAFTA, making trade a lot more harder for us to, uh, or conduct trade, so transaction costs have increased. It's not like we can't trade with these countries, it's just a little bit more expensive, and we can still get these products from different countries, but it would have been nice to, have, to stay in NAFTA or rewrite NAFTA in order to um, 
increased trade just in our own continent where, where countries are bordering each other. So is NAFTA an optimum currency area? So factors in favor. So the degree of economic integration of Canada, US and Mexico. Now similarity of economic structures between Canada and the US, but not so much Mexico. So I mean, it's still favorable. Factors that are opposed to this currency area. Mexico couldn't use monetary policy in case of economic downturn. So if we had the dollar, the Mexico doesn't use um, dollars, they use pesos. And that could be a huge issue. Our monetary policies might not be the same, not might not have the same impact as impact on their market compared to ours. And then Canada is concerned about potential loss of um, their sovereignty or having their own nation uh, due to this um, just being the dollar, uh, the dollar being the optimum currency area. So that's basically it for chapter eight. Um, if you guys have questions, by all means, drop a comment. Um, email me, come to the Zoom sessions. Chapter eight is just focusing on trade arrangements um, and why it's important as opposed to having a hierarchy uh, a global organization like the WTO. As opposed to WTO, you have um, the European Union or you have NAFTA or you have um, regional trade agreements that help increase trade productivity. All of these are meant to increase trade. By increasing trade, you know what this, um, how this benefits society, how it benefits uh, the consumer producer and com who it hurts who it helps all of this stuff is just um in a broader scale so again um i hope you guys are doing well with these videos hope you're staying healthy and with your loved ones uh, i will see you guys soon thank you